Welcome to another D&D Stories. I am your host, T the Writer. This is a show where we sit here in front of a shelf full of gaming stuff and tell you all my D&D stories. Now today, we are going to go back and do the second part of the Iron Heart of Innis campaign, in which we join Cryptbreaker James, uh, John the Knot Paladin, uh, Neath the Ranger, and Eden the Halberd Swinging Paladin. So, at the end of the last session, we picked up the actual object, the Iron Heart of Innis, hidden in a book that we couldn't read in a language that we'd never seen before. So there we are in this crypt. There's a dead Kinku to one side. There's two dead uh, transdimensional cat monsters, displacer beasts, sorry. Two dead displacer beasts, and we have found the item that Crypt Raker James was breaking into the crypt to look for. And we go, and Neath goes to uh, loot the Kinku to, you know, see if this little bird man, they're hoarders anyway, to see if he has anything on him. And he's got a gold ring on him. So I was like, oh, that'd be a nice chunk of change. I mean, in most settings of D&D, things like gold rings can go for up to a thousand gold. So that'd be a pretty nice chunk of change for each one of us. And so we've got the book, the Iron Heart, and this gold ring. And the doors had slammed shut on us. So we decided, you know, we searched to see, you know, how did this kinku get in here? How did he move the doors when he was so tiny? And we never could figure it out. We we looked for a while to see if there were any other rooms, any other ways out, but there just weren't. So Neath kind of uh, speculated that maybe since the Displacer Beasts could teleport from one place to another, maybe he like hitched a ride or something. I found it very, very hard to believe that this Kenku was staying there with the Displacer Beasts. So that has yet to kind of click in my head as to what they, how they were associated. But like I said, I was getting a serious like guard dog vibe off of them. So maybe he was there to feed them. Maybe he was there for whatever. But we also found a letter on the Kinku written in like a sloppy kind of common that was promising the Kinku uh, riches if he came down into this particular crypt. And I'm still wondering, how the frick did he get the door open? How did he get in here? He sees, like, you know, as tall as your waist, and, you know, all, all 40 pounds of him is not going to get that door open because it took all four of us to pry it open. But whatever. Um, monster placement in the game, LOL. But, uh, yeah, so we were like, okay, so he doesn't live here. He was sent here. And uh, we kind of root around through the filth for a while. There's really nothing left for us to look at. But uh, so we decide, okay, why don't, since uh, the guy that sent Crypt Breaker James here, uh, his name is Tom Lim, I believe. Where's my notes? Uh, Tom Lim sent Crypt Breaker James here to retrieve this, this book, this Iron Heart. Uh, and he is since deceased. Oh, there they are. There they are. You'd think I'd prepare better for this, but whatever. That Tom Lim had sent him here to find this, but he is since deceased since, you know, getting the sage background on your character sheet. You have a letter from a dead colleague, so we've worked that into the story by now. And that he was going to receive, uh, a hundred gold pieces for this book in this heart, which in this setting apparently is quite a bit, and we'll get to that later. But a hundred gold pieces for this book, just to go into this three-room crypt in a crypt that's not locked, in a church that's not occupied, etc., etc., well, other than our, our hobo not-cleric, John, but you get what I mean. So, we kind of deliberate for a while, and we go, well, you know, why don't we... You know, we have fought long and hard for this. Two, two teleporting cat monsters and a kinku and, you know, little spider goblins outside. You know, we all deserve to know what this heart is for, why this, what language this book is in. You know, isn't everybody curious? Yes, surely I am curious as well. We should travel together. So, you know, a party is formed 
under the pretense of uh, the mystery of the Iron Heart of Innes. So, given that it's still in the middle of the night, we didn't do any time jumps or anything to uh, at the end of the last session, uh, we still have to go back outside and... Uh, what did we decide to do? We decided to, to rest until next light, and since John had already made himself at home in this cathedral ruin, he had like a, a side room, like a cell, for uh, the cleric that lived there last, who had since been buried, but um, we decided we're going to stay there for the night, and we, we crawl out, and we, we push the doors open, you know, the, it's, it looks like a well on the outside, so we push the doors back open the way they were, uh, my torches are still there, sitting in the rungs, and the edder caps, the little spider monsters, uh, are not there. We see, like, one or two of them peeking over the lip of the freaking thing, but as soon as we, as soon as we start coming up and out, there's nobody around. You know, Neath comes out, like, arrow half-cocked, like, you know, did somebody slam the fucking doors on us? And Cryptbreaker James is still kind of speculating, you know, there weren't any, like, locks on this door, so, you know... And it was, uh, this grave, this crypt has been robbed before we got here, so maybe there was, like, an enchantment on the, on the door, so, like, if they're left open for X amount of time, then they just slam shut by themselves, you know, to keep the rain out, to keep the elements out. You know, it could have to do with the phases of the moon, because Kor, the goddess of this cathedral, ran off with, uh, Treptor. The, the moon god, so sh maybe maybe the moon, the phases of the moon push shadows, there's some kind of magic, etc, etc. Or, uh, given that a, uh, a kinku got in here and the edder caps are running around outside, there could be something as simple as a pressure pad, like a hidden button somewhere that, you know, five pounds of pressure and the doors spring open, or if the inner caps are running around on the surface, one of them steps on it and it slams shut again. So, who knows? Those doors were weird. We should have, I guess I should have looked for a, uh, a mechanism of some kind, because we, we're doing really bad on all the doors and entryways. And, uh, we, we leave the torches there to keep the place well lit, and we wander back into the cathedral, we shut the door, you know, to keep the edder caps out, you know, we put torches in what few sconces are left, and John takes us back to, like, his little, his little hidey hole, I guess, and it's the place where the old cleric used to stay, and no, he is not a cleric of Kor, he's a cleric of, uh, Bryn. And a retired one at that. He is, like I said, he is beyond his his prime. So, you know, he used to be like a level 10 cleric back in the day, but now he's like, age has withered him down to like level 4. So, he's out of shape. He's still a big dude. He's still got like the skills, but only in like short bursts. You know, he's like, he could swing a sword and do a an amazing combo of weapon attacks, but then he'd be like, uh, uh, uh. So he's he's rusty, is what it is. He he may even gain levels faster than we do, just because he's he's already done some of these things. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised if that was a mechanic. Like if if John gained XP at twice the rate we did, because he's getting back into shape, because he's already technically been level ten. I wouldn't complain. Just to see a hero like that back in his prime, or a a cleric like that back in his prime. Who knows? And it's like the it's like the uh, the Mister Fantastic uh, exercise montage. Even if he's like fat and out of shape, he's still super fucking strong because he's a superhero. But then when he starts doing the exercise and stuff, he gets back into shape, loses the pot belly, all that stuff. Then he's freaking amazing, like he used to be. Or incredible. Sorry, Mister Incredible, not Mister Fantastic. Mister Incredible. Um, but anyway, we hole up for the night, and we, we close the door, like I said, we've got torches, we shutter the windows, etc, etc. It's already the middle of the night, so we're gonna take, like, a short rest and set out at, at, like, daybreak, like, 8 in the morning, or whatever it happens to be. And we, uh, we set up watches in case the edder caps get, get brave, and, um, 
I think Crypt Breaker James was the only one that didn't get a shift uh, on watch just because he was he was the only one that was injured, so he needed like extra extra rest, I guess. Uh, but with Neath's healing spell and then enough rest, I think you get what is it? Eight hours of rest is your level times two in hit points healed or something like that. As long as it's not like a catastrophic injury, like you've lost an arm or you've broken a bone or something, regular flesh wounds will heal your level times two if you're doing like an eight hour rest. So it's not too bad. And a short rest, I think, is like an hour or more in fifth edition. I think so. Anyway. Um, John, again, shows no sign of preparing any spells, doing anything like that. I'm starting to wonder if maybe his, uh, I forget if it's intelligence or wisdom. It's probably wisdom for clerics. If his wisdom is too low to cast spells, that'd be kind of funny. It's like he's, he's like old and broken down, so he's... He's fallen behind on, on how to cast spells, or maybe he can only do cantrips, I don't know. He's not. At, he's gone two sessions out of six, and I've not seen any clerical magic, so I'm starting to think that he's just a fighter. a uh, Like a devout fighter, you know? Uh, but he's got, he's got the marks along his arm. He's got the, uh, the shards of metal in his arm, which is only for, fo for serious followers of Bryn, so I'm, I'm still speculating on him. Um, what else? So we set out at first light, and so we decide that, you know, given that there was a Kenku, and given that there were Displacer Beasts guarding this thing, we decide we're going to take the Iron Heart, we're, we're calling it the Iron Heart of Innis, because that's just the region we're in. We, we take the Iron Heart of Innis out of the book, and we give it to Eden, our paladin, and I go, okay, you know, given what was guarding it, guarding it, and given that my colleague who wanted it is dead, why don't we keep the book and the heart separate? So, Crypt Breaker James takes the big, thick, uh, uh, what was it, leather, gold, and steel bound book, and he puts it in his bag. You know, he was the one hired for it, so if somebody snatches this book from him, or, like, knocks him over the head and fucking robs him in the middle of the day, somehow, I don't know, it can happen. The, they would get the book, but they wouldn't get the heart inside. So we hand the Iron Heart of Innis off to Eden, and she, you know, shoves it in her bag. And we keep the two things separate, because I'm guessing in order to use this heart, or in order to use this book, you need both objects, like lock and key, you know? Like, maybe the book contains instructions on how the heart works, or maybe the heart doesn't work without the presence of the book, etc., etc., so we separate them, and we set out for uh, the nearest town, which is where Tom Lem lives. And, what was it? Carla Hort, I think? It, it had a strange, a strange pronunciation. I'm just going to call it Carla Hort. And it's within, uh, like, six miles. I think, our, I think our DM James said that it was, like, you know, two, three, four hours walk, and if you're walking... Uh, the average person can cover a, about a mile in half an hour, so I called it six miles. So six miles towards town, and it's a well-traveled road. There's travelers going to and from, you know, it's the biggest, it's not really a city, it's the biggest town, you know, with, with cobblestone streets and, you know, large businesses. There's not really like an open market. This is a well-established, uh, kind of a crossroads kind of place. Like, if you're going to the next major city, there's major cities around it, but this one's, like, smack dab in the middle of several of them, so it gets plenty of big business in it anyway. So there's carts going by, you know, people on horseback. You see mostly humans uh, and, you know, a couple of elves, one one or two dwarves. You know, it's, it's a human region, I'm guessing. And we we see, you know... Farmers going back and forth with their stocks, covered wagons, horse-drawn carriages. You know, this, you know, it's a dirt road until we get there, but there's plenty of people just going back and forth. It's kind of a highway, freeway, whatever you want to call it. So we are not lacking for company. 
until we run across a uh, an old man on the street and or on the on the road. And as he's approaching, you know, within one or two hundred yards, the ring that uh, Neath picked up from the Kenku starts screaming, and not like anything audible, just like ah, just like 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 some kind of hag scream. Or, or, or siren, wailer, something like that. And he, uh, I look over, I'm like, your, your pants are wailing, Neil, I, or Neith, I, I can't. And he, he's like, it's not me, it's not me. And he's like patting all of, his, all of his pockets. And he pulls out the ring. And the ring is like vibrating and like shaking like a jumping bean. And he's like trying to hold it between his two fingers, and it's just wailing. We're getting weird looks from people on the street, and we're like, "Oh, don't, don't look at us, don't look at us." And he quickly like wraps it up in some rags, and like he's like keeps it down, and shoves it back in his pocket. And just as he's doing this, this old man approaches us, and he goes, "Hello there, you know, I'm, I," and he was he was really awkward about it. He said, "I seem to be, you know, in in the place." where I have, you know, too much money and I am looking to buy some things. I don't suppose you have anything of the, uh, what was it, of extraordinary value on you. I'm looking to buy things. And we all look at each other and we go, things? Things like what? I was like, well, I, I enjoy reading. Do you have any excellent books on you? And we are immediately suspicious. Because, like, like I said, Displacer Beasts, Kenku, Dead Colleague, now there's a strange man on the road who's out buying books of interest. And I'm like, mmm. And we're, we're all, mmm. Yeah. <laughs> so, since he's being vague, he, he doesn't go to books right away, but since he's being vague, Neath takes out the skins, because he's a ranger, the skins of the two Displacer Beasts, and he's like, I've got these two uh, magical skins. They've still got the tentacles on them, and you know they're still bloody and fresh. You know, you want to buy these? And he's like, Oh, uh, no, not not really. You have any books of interest on you, or anything like that? I'm quite the avid reader, and I was like, No, no. <laughs> so eventually, the the ring. By the time he gets there, the ring has stopped screaming. So I'm getting a weird vibe off of this and I thought uh, we, we kind of send him on his way and he goes from like person to person but all the people are nearby to us like he's he's zeroed in on this screaming ring that the Kenku was wearing and I'm trying to piece this together and eventually we kind of put it together that uh, this Kenku was either like sent into that crypt like uh, to die, like as bait, you know, to either to set off the traps or to be chewed up by the displacer beasts or to be killed by a uh, group of adventurers like ourselves and to be looted of his ring. And the ring, we're, we're puzzling it out, like, is this like a predator and prey kind of thing? And if so, what kind of predator is this, is this little old man? And I was like, we... You know, we don't mention the book, we don't take it out, we don't do anything when he's nearby, but we have Neith follow him for a short time, and Eden goes with him, just kind of blending in with the crowd, because there's a lot of people going to and from this road. And Neith follows him and rolls really well to, to kind of blend into the crowd, to like not be seen while this little old man goes from place to place with his walking stick. And um, eventually when he gives up, this this old man just kind of like steps out of existence. Like, it's like there was an invisible curtain and he just like dropped his walking stick and stepped behind it and he was gone. And Neith is like, what do your elf eyes see? Or what do your, you know, ranger eyes see? Well, apparently nothing at all because this guy just like, there was a tear in the fabric of reality but he couldn't see it and this old man stepped through it and was gone. And I was like, God, well, that's that's high-level magic to not be saying any magic words, not moving your hands, not making any gestures, no, not drinking any potions, not throwing any fairy dust. He just, like, stepped through the air, and he was gone. And I was like, that's a high-level spellcaster there. But 
Crypt Breaker James doesn't know much about magic beyond what you would use to seal a tomb, so he's just kind of speculating. You know, that's a that's a high end spellcaster to not be saying any magic words or waving your hands around, surely. And you know, John doesn't know anything about arcane magic, and neither does Eden, and they're our only magic users. Well, no, I guess Neath has ranger spells, but that's something else entirely. There's, they're in different branches of magic than what it would take to step through a dimension door or something similar to that. But you would see a dimension door. This guy was just gone. And we speculate for a while, and, and Neath brings back the walking stick and uh, gives it to John, who's it's like, now you, can, now you can pretend to be lame all you want. <laughs> or will it be pretending? ha <laughs> ha. And, and Kurt Breaker James kind of pokes fun at it, and he's like, hey, we, we sent him out, and he brought back a stick. Good boy, good boy. <laughs> but then but then John takes the stick, and he's like, who's the dog now? He's I gave him the stick. He took the stick. <laughs> so we're poking fun at it. There's already, like, a companionship forming here. Uh, so Eden is our little bird. Uh, Neath is our dog, and... John is our not cleric, and Crypt Breaker James is our coward. So we've already got this weird, this weird dynamic going on. But um, we've got a stick, and it's a nice like carved walking stick. But there's nothing to it. It's just a, you know, it doesn't have like an eagle head on it or anything. But it's just a regular carved walking stick. And John keeps it, and we head on into town. You know extremely wary of, of what's going on and we've got a lot of options and unfortunately for me the this was kind of where the session just kind of went off on a three-hour tangent for me because we we needed to get the ring checked we needed to ask around for uh, who knew about Tom Loom's death. We needed to go to Tom Loom's house. We needed to get the uh, the Displacer Beast um, skins, either sell them or turn them into a cloak. We had like eight things to do, and it took a long time for all of us to do. And yeah, I know, when you go into a city, that's when you do all your buying and selling, but usually that's something just as a matter of personal taste. I leave like between sessions, but we... We had a, like a, a 30 minute conversation with, with the Tanner, I think. Neath and John went in with the two Displacer Beast skins and they wanted to have one of them turned into a Displacer Beast cloak. Which if you don't know, a Displacer Beast cloak gives you advantage on, is it stealth or hide? Or no, there's no hide anymore. It's just stealth. It gives you advantage on stealth. So you, you roll 2d20 and take the higher. And it's like a gorgeous black, like velvety cloak that's a beautiful piece. Because it's a trans-dimensional, you know, teleporting cat monster. Its skin is going to make something pretty damn exotic. So he basically when all was said and done after after a half hour of role playing uh, he got the displacer beast cloak and gave the tanner the other one got a few turn uh, gave him a few gold pieces and he also got a uh, a magic quiver like a really nice magic quiver that um Whatever arrows he puts into it, Neath can now pull an arrow and name an element. And that arrow will be of that element now. So it's like a super fucking overpowered, super awesome quiver. So it's like fire arrow, lightning arrow, poison arrow, screaming arrow, death arrow. Well, I hope not death arrow. If Neath can pull death arrows from this thing, I sure as fuck hope not. Because that's a plus eight to uh, attack and damage. He could be like, you know, death arrow human. So any human that he shoots with a death arrow from this quiver would get plus eight to hit and plus eight to damage. What was it? No, no, actually, our DM said it was elemental damage. So that's what, 
fire, cold, electricity, acid, poison. There's, there's tons of elements. Anyway, he could name elemental damages as he's pulling arrows. I was like, holy crap. He can just buy normal arrows and now they are all elements. I was like, well, Neath just got all the... <laughs> we actually poked fun at him. He got the Displacer Beast Cloak and the the Quiver of All Elements. Just like all at once. He's like, okay, you've got all the magic items. You can retire now. You can go home. The other three of you still have an adventure to go on. So our ranger is like pimped out now in this gorgeous cloak. And this quiver, you can like pull a fire arrow, pull a lightning arrow, pull an ice arrow. Suddenly he's got way more utility. Not that, uh, and rangers have enough, have a lot of utility as it is. Now he can like freeze lakes and, you know, set off powder kegs and electrocute wet enemies and just all kinds of different stuff with this, with this super like quiver of all elements. And, um, what else? Eden goes to the cathedral to pay her respects because that's what her character, what her family does. They would go from from temple to temple, from cathedral to cathedral, delivering ice, you know, paying their respects, paying money, monies to the church. And I think she parted with, what was it, like 20 silver, so about two gold pieces. Uh, and again, I'm, I'm having a rough time grasping the economy in this setting because if if like four gold pieces and a displacer skin is what it takes to get you a quiver like that, then I may have to ask the DM for some prices before I buy anything between sessions. But um, the you can kind of tell from the way these people are acting, just the 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 townies, that they're used to ripping people off. This it almost has like a carnival feel to it. Like the guy in the tannery tries to rip off Neath and John. You know the the priest only talks to Eden until she's promised money to the to like the poor box or the donation box or whatever. Then he moves on. The um, the rooms are a little expensive, like like two gold expensive, like way more than I probably should have paid. If that's the way the economy works here, um, just a bunch of different. Ways. You can tell, like, they're used to taking advantage of strangers. Like, there's no small businesses here. It's like, the jeweler is the only jeweler. The tanner the tanner and the blacksmith are in cahoots, you know, and if, if you get in good with the tanner, then you can tell, them, tell the blacksmith that you were sent and you won't get ripped off as badly. It's like, there's a... Uh, a business owner's like unity here where they're, they're raking in the dough, probably more so than they should, but... That's the uh, that's the environment. That's the economy here. You have to be careful and haggle and you know kind of bully these people to make sure you get a, the proper price. I didn't even haggle on the price of our rooms because um, Crypt Breaker James, since you know these three, you know Ranger Paladin cleric, you know beat the ass of everything in that crypt while he stood there holding the light. That you know these any one of those things, even the Kenku probably would have stood a chance to just straight up kill Kurt Breaker James because he doesn't expect things to be alive down there. He's not a combat character. You know, I'm not that kind of rogue. Um, he, he, he would have been dead without them. So he's feeling very much in like a life debt. So he, um, he buys rooms for the night for everybody, you know, so they can, they can pair off, uh, he, he buys everybody baths, he buys everybody dinner, and then uh, while everybody's off doing their own errands, uh, Neath had handed off the ring to Eden, and eventually it was handed off to James to take to the jeweler and get it like identified, because none of us have uh, detect magic or the identify spell. I'm, I'm not sure how that works in this setting, because detect magic will give you a school of magic, but identify will tell you exactly what it is and we don't have either of those so this is not torchlight where we can carry around 50,000 identify magic item spell scrolls and just like hand them out like candy we actually have to take it to an expert so Crypt Breaker James takes this this screaming ring to the jeweler 
and we and I take it to this lady and I say, you know, can you identify this? And she rolls out her runes and she puts the ring on it and she got the little the, the, the jeweler's eye that they put on to zoom in on it and they poke she pokes it for a while and she says that this is a ring of tracking. And the ring of tracking will scream, apparently, when the caster is near. Which tells me, again, that that Kenku was probably sent to be bait. Because we would kill him, take his stuff, as adventurers tend to do, and then we would basically be walking around with, like, a target on our chests, you know, saying, you know, we killed the Kenku, therefore we were in the crypt, therefore we probably have the book you're looking for. And we're guessing that that little old man was our was our culprit, the one that wrote the letter for the Kinku to go down there and find riches. Yeah. He was he wasn't there for riches, he was there to be bait, is is what I'm guessing. So either somebody knew Crypt Breaker James was going down there, or uh he the the Kinku was sit was sent to set off all the traps, something. There's, there's other motivations at work here, and I'm trying to puzzle this out as best I can, because James is is a good DM, but he's very tight-lipped. You know, we're not going to figure out the mystery, you know, two sessions in out of six. He's very he's very skimpy on the details, very skimpy on the, on the answers. Don't turn this into Lost, James. You know, you're going to have to give us some answers before we decide to leave the island. <laughs> but, um... Uh, yeah, she tells us it's a ring of tracking. It's it screams when the when the caster is near. I think it's it's a bait trap. So we decide what else do we have to do? We did a lot of walking, a lot of talking in this session. Not a lot of dungeons and dragons sing going on this session. But whatever, it can't be all it can't be all combat. It can't be all traps all the time. But eh. So I leave the ring behind in our in our hotel room or in our um, in the in like the tavern room. Like I, I leave it like on the, on the top of the uh, the bed post. You know, like it's in plain sight, so nobody will see it there. And we decide we're gonna go to the arcane. Uh, was it the arcane university? Something similar. There is a special name for it. I'll just call it the Arcane University. But basically, a school of learning for the, the magically inclined is, is in this place. And we go to speak with several professors. There's a lot of talking. Like I said, it's, it's, this was kind of our, our cutscene game where we do a lot of talking, a lot of role-playing. We talk to one professor who... Uh, he doesn't even know that Tom Limbs is dead. It's only been a couple of days, apparently, that he's been that he's been gone. So Cryptbreaker James knew Tom Lim was dead, but his colleague that he worked with every day did not. Which makes me wonder where is Tom Lim's body and how did he die and how did I know and nobody else did? I don't know. Maybe James can fill that in for us later. But we ask around, and, and Cryptbreaker James, you know, with the book that they can't read, since I am, in fact, of the, uh, the sage background, the specialization that I took was scribe, so I can write uh, really good calligraphy, even if I don't understand the language. So taking out the, the book, the leather, gold, and steel bound book, I, I open it, you know, that night while we're in the tavern, or while we're in our, our, our hotel, our inn rooms, and I copy, like, 50 little, like, smidgens of language. So it would come across as gibberish, but we're just trying to identify the language right now because we can't even recognize the lettering. And, you know, we close the book, and I've got, you know, this, this copy of, you know, enough little samples that it, hopefully it can be identified. We take it to like the the arcane language professor who's like he writes in elvish he writes in draconic he dr he writes in all the magic languages that you can write scroll <clears throat> excuse me that you can write scrolls on 
and you know I, I take it to him and I go hey can you identify this for me do you know what language this is and I learned next to nothing to be honest I was really disappointed this guy he goes over and he like takes out a big book and he flips it open and there were um, there were like some very vague fairy tales that went with this old, old language, that they were out, like, on islands along the coast that there were, uh, what were they called? There was this race of uh, men that were built. They were called blank men. And they had uh, vast amounts of extraordinary knowledge that they would share with the mortal races. All you had to do was kind of, like, go up and ask they like they they were nonviolent they didn't have personalities they didn't have emotions but they were so full of information knowledge arcana you know stuff like that and um supposedly they were ageless they could take on any shape they were they were just he kept referring to them as blank men and i was like and i'm, and I'm me, the player, I'm going, is that is that the Warforged? Is that Atlantis? Is that Danger Will Robinson robots? And I'm like, I'm, I'm already scratching my chin that we're going to run into, like, the the ancient Old War technology at this point. But he's basically referring to, to robots, men of iron that are built, that are full of information. Sounds like a computer, but... That's not something that Crypt Breaker James would know about. So, so he's thinking of you know men that were built you know like like a moving suit of armor. He's like, well, it's it's not really there. It's it's very vague. You know, it's just stories that have been passed down from generation to generation to generation. It's basically like telling the story of Cinderella or telling the story of 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 Joan of Arc. You know, you can tell. Uh, you know, all the stories, all the different versions, you know, they have certain things in common, but they're all different. You know, it's very, it's all so vague. And I learned next to nothing other than these few details that they were built, that they had hearts of iron, or supposedly had, actually, no, he didn't even say that. He didn't say that these blank men had hearts of iron, so it may not even be them. But the language that was paired up with this had to do with these quote-unquote blank men that they were emotionless that they were built by someone else that they were so full of knowledge and that's basically all i learned in like a 45 minute span of of, of role playing was was like those three tidbits of fact i was kind of disappointed to be honest but again we're only two sessions in and you know i come back out to where the other, because I'm, I'm kind of like talking shop with this guy because I've, I've got, you know, the sage background, the, the, the scribe specialization. I'm already, I've already got, you know, knowledge arcana five, um, uh, as high as it'll go for my character. So I'm like talking the talk with this guy and like, I write my name in draconic to show how cool I am. And, you know, we, he, you know, he sees a kindred spirit. So I, I, I talk him up for a while to learn what I can, but he knows nothing. And I was like, okay, what do we do? What do we do from here? I go back, you know, it's a beautiful, like, college campus, basically. And I go back to the party who's waiting for me. And I was like, you know, I relate all this information. And Eden is, a, is instantly elated because she heard stories of the blank men, and she's actually been to these islands. Uh, you know, in her travels as a child with her family going from place to place deli delivering uh, ice. She had apparently visited these islands at some point and heard the tales, you know, because they're children's stories. Like I said, it's like Joan of Arc or Cinderella. You would hear these as a child, like Santa Claus. They, yeah, I think that was what James compared him to. You would hear about the, bl the, the blank men, like, in the same in the same way, in the same, like, breath that you would hear about Santa Claus. And I was like, okay, so it's a a, a child's myth, a, a fantasy, uh, what was I, a fairy tale. They're, they're basically a fairy tale. But here we are with, you know, an exceptionally 
nice piece of hard proof that maybe these blank men were real, or at least based on something that was real. Even if they're like a lost civilization, or if they're like rotted, or in cryostasis 50 floors down a scary dungeon or something. At some point, apparently, this language was associated with these blank men. And Eden is like squeeing in delight because she heard these these tales as a child and you know she had always wanted to see one of these blank men and I was like well what else is there for us to do and we, we go back and we're getting ready to like regroup in the tavern or in the inn rather and um, as we're approaching we can hear through one of the windows we can hear the ring screaming and I was like oh god I left it on a bedpost I didn't wrap it up so people can probably hear the screaming and James suddenly goes give me a perception check and we all roll and I just happened to land a 20 and I see this like beautiful like tall and slender you know just gorgeous elven woman walking down the street and she like looks up at the window where the screaming ring was and she goes inside and I point this out to my to my fellows and I was like there's something strange about her she came here straight away looked up at the window and then went in I was like this this could be another like agent of you know whoever you know whoever whatever ended up killing Tom Lem and sending out Tengu and, you know, maybe associated with this old man. There's a lot of players that seem to be moving around for this Iron Heart. It was kind of confusing, to be honest. But this woman comes in and is obviously going straight to my room. So we leave John downstairs to, like, be the bouncer. Like, if she runs out, then he'll catch her. Which, in hindsight, was probably not the best idea idea because he's basically one of our two tanks so we leave him downstairs to kind of like watch the door in case she makes a run for it so he's got like a pint of of like hard cider and he's he's too big to sit at the bar so he like grabs a table and gets like a short stool and pulls a table up to himself like japanese style and he's like squats there he's cut bread and meat and he's just gonna like watch for it see if see if she goes and Neith sneaks up the stairs after her and Eden does the same and Crypt Breaker James doesn't know how to stealth even though he's a rogue I'm not that kind of rogue <laughs> and she goes up and she goes into the room that is next to Crypt Breaker James's room where the ring is and we're we're kind of biting our lips is like well what do we do? Do we lure her inside Crypt Breaker James's room and like catch her and question her? And that's that's kind of the plan that's forming. And we're going, okay. I'll go up the stairs and go into my room, like make a good show, like shut the door really loud. And the ring has by then gone silent, so she knows exactly where it is or what room it's in. She goes into the room next to it. And Crypt Breaker James goes and he like unlocks his room and he's like, I'm so tired and you know, goes inside and shuts the door really loudly. Meanwhile, Neith and Eden are waiting around the corner to see if this woman will like come out and like knock on the door and try to get into his room. And uh Crypt Breaker left the uh his uh his dungeon delving pack, which had the book inside, with John, so that if he got his ass kicked, then the book wouldn't fall into this woman's hands. Little did he know. But, um, nothing happens for a while. And, and Eden and Neith kind of look at each other and they wait. They wait for a minute. And then there's like some scuffling inside this woman's room. And they're screaming. And Neith immediately just like pull, pulls an arrow from his all elements quiver and like half pulls it and runs and just like boots the door in and he's like aiming around with his bow and there's nobody there uh, and we're like god damn it and then this woman 
falls from the ceiling and like like just judo kicks him in the face just like lands on him like if you can imagine uh like some horror movie you know the the girl with the long black hair like clinging to the ceiling that's basically what this woman was doing and then she just like drops on him and knocks him down and then we like we roll initiative immediately after that because she is not what she seems as soon as she like collides with Neith, there's like a shimmer about her that says that this is an illusion. This is a, uh, what is it called? A glamour spell, a, a five sense spell, you know, where you, you look, sound, feel, taste, etc. All five senses will believe something else unto this illusion. But touch, if you, if you bang on a glamour spell, it will shimmer like water, so it's, it's not you can tell it's like not real as soon as you start like poking at it. This woman drops onto Neith's head. I don't know to elbow drop him. I don't know. <laughs> to, <laughs> to get up on the tightrope and do the do the three rope elbow drop. Oh yeah. <laughs> and so we roll initiative immediately. John has no inkling of this. He's downstairs watching the door. So Crip Breaker James, hearing all this, like, rushes out of his room, and you know he's he's got like a knife on him because he's left his pack in his room, and John has his other pack, so he's got like his little dinky dagger, and that's about it. And um, we roll initiative, and straight away we already you know this is this is not an elven woman. This may not even be a woman. This may not be even be anything in particular because we've seen enough teleporting transdimensional bullshit happen in the crypt on the road and everywhere else so for all we know this woman is is like a displacer beast lord or something like that and we're like okay i've gotta you know grab her i've gotta make sure she doesn't like bust through the fucking window like an ac action star and get away we've gotta like pin this lady before she teleports or does something weird and then comes the most glorious part of the entire session. Cryptbreaker James, I think I rolled like a 19 or a 20 on initiative. I rolled like four 20s in a row right here, and it was really weird. I was waiting for James to like call me a cheater or something, because we're using real dice, but none of us have like cameras on our dice. Uh, so this is like the, the word of honor sort of game. So if you roll something, you have to be truthful about it. And there's no reason to lie, because then otherwise, why would you play? But I must have rolled four 20s in a row on this particular exchange. And Cryptbreaker James, having heard her fall from the ceiling onto Nathan, they, they start combat, tears out of his room, runs, grabs the... Um, edge of the door frame of this next room and like uses his momentum to swing around it and it's like Jack Black in the pick of destiny going power slide and flings himself onto his knees and just like shreds his pants as he goes power slide goes through the doorway Neath has to make like a what was it a reflex save a dexterity save to like Spider-Man leap into the air as Crypt Breaker James slides along his knees straight, in, straight into this woman, grabs her around the waist and like poof, straight onto her back with his like face just like poof, straight onto her, like basically stunning them both. So Neath does this like crouching tiger hidden dragon or, or what was it the next karate kid where she jumps up onto the car and he basically leaps into the air while Crypt Breaker James power slides into this woman grabs her around the middle poof, and they go down hard and he's like holding her by the waist and got her arms like pinned at her waist and of course this catches her off guard and as soon as they hit the ground uh, this this glamour spell I think either cracked or broke or something like that because we straight away realize that this is not an elven woman this is a hag and if you don't know what a hag is imagine the ugliest witch you have ever seen in your life like to the point where she's embraced such dark rotting magic that she's left whatever race she happened to be 
has been left behind. Her voice is like a nasty, ear-splitting wail. You know, they, they live in swamps. They live in squalor. The, it's like the, the Georgia... The Georgia Swamp Witch is, is kind of the, what they're getting across here. They've got the hook nose and the warts, and they're really gross and bloated, like they died in water and stuff like that. This this gorgeous... I'm expecting to get a, a nice, you know, face full of creamy elven boobies, but instead I get, like, hag lumps, and I'm like, Ah, oh, God! <laughs> as soon as I knock her down, you know, not nice elven boobies, I just, like just like hit the ground squish like like your grandma decided just like <laughs> so I'm like she's she's making like rolls to break free but actually the, one of the things that Crypt Breaker James is good at is athletics because uh, when you get to a certain level as a rogue you can multiply uh, two of your skills by two so I've got Athletics 5 and Persuasion 5, but I have times 2 multipliers next to them, so I get a plus 10 to Athletics at level 4. That's outrageous in, in this mechanic system. Get a plus 10 to hold this lady around the waist, like keeping her arms pinned. And uh, we're trying to like capture this woman, but it's not going to happen. She's she's screaming like nasty spells at Neath to make him crazy for a few seconds. She's taken uh uh Eden like tries to block the window. We're we're beating on her, like trying to like submit bah, 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 bah. But she's clawing, she's fighting, she's shouting obscenities and spells. And she she breaks into uh Neath's mind very briefly with like a like a hag shriek sort of thing that he what do we call it we, we called it the hurt your feelings spell because it it basically shouts like the worst thing you could possibly imagine like it looks through all your memories all all the lowest times in your life and it goes it's it's your fault your master died, or something. Like the guy that took him in out of the woods, out of... And, and taught him archery and the ways of being a ranger. It's, and, you know, there was a giant involved, apparently. We only got vague details because we were seeing the narration through Neath's eyes that um, he was filling this giant full of arrows, and apparently this, there was a giant attack, and his master died in... in uh, in the battle and he ran away into the woods and this rattles Neath so hard that he takes I think like a couple of d4 worth of <laughs> worth of psychic damage but um, we, we called it the hurt your feelings spell because it rolled it either rolled critical damage or it rolled like really high close to maximum damage and I jokingly said before the damage was rolled, I, or before the spell was rolled, I jokingly said, your feelings are hurt really, really badly. <laughs> or it's like, it critically hits, your feelings are hurt really bad, and sure enough, yeah, they were. So, good job, and James, by the way, uh, uh, DM James, not Kurt Fricker James, James, good, I good idea working the backstory of this, uh, of Neath into this because that's the kind of thing that actually would do mental damage when it's imbued with magic that's a legitimate way to do psychic damage to somebody is to bring up their worst shame in the middle of a fight and then imbue it with like arcanic punch Oof. but you know this makes Neath like reach for his his quiver of all elements and he pulls an arrow he makes it a fire arrow and like shoots her in the shoulder, which, by the way, my head is like six inches away, so if he'd missed, god damn. And he shoots this one, and, and uh, I think at some point James said that this hag was prone, because she's like on her back. I've got my arms around her, her arms are pinned, so she can't like claw or mess with anything. She has to get unstuck first, she has to get untackled. And as soon as I hear the word prone, I was like, ah! That's right, I'm playing a rogue. So when I hear the word prone, I pull 
my dagger, and I was like, I can actually do a sneak attack when somebody's prone. It doesn't matter if it's not sneaky, it's just a sneak attack. So I, like, put this dagger two hands, just, like, doing, like, the psycho, the psycho stabs while I'm straddling this thing. Oh, I straddled a hag. Oh. Oh, I straggled, straddled a hag. Ugh. Ugh. Oh, I straddled a hag. Anyway, I, I stabbed her a bunch. <laughs> and then, uh, I think Neith placed another arrow, or Eden must have hit her with the halberd or something. She she died, finally. Meanwhile, John is downstairs, still enjoying his mead and his, his bread. So you can imagine, like, this desperate fight. <laughs> the Karina Barana music going while we're fighting this hag. And then downstairs it switches to, like, elevator music while John is, like, sitting there in slowly enjoying his, his cider with his pinky sticking out and, like, chewing on bread really slowly with a blank expression on his face. <laughs> and then it goes back to us. We're just, like, dance fighting around, around like it's a freaking play. And then it goes back to him and the elevator music starts back up. <laughs> and he's still eating. And he's like, another please. And then it goes back to the fight. <laughs> he can't hear any of this because it's a busy bar in a tavern, you know. So I felt bad. I felt bad for John because he got left out of the one fight in this whole session. But uh, we kill her straight away. And eventually uh, John decides that he's going to come up and kind of check on us because it's, it's been, you know, a couple of minutes. And... Nothing's exploded yet, and nothing, you know, nothing's bad has happened. But this hag, you know, her her glamour spell broken. This hag is is dead now. And we're like, we're in the middle of an inn and tower, and what are we gonna do? And you know, John kind of comes in. He's got his his tankard in one hand, and he's got he's still chewing on his bread. He's like, are you guys done or what? And he's like, very nonchalant that. This obviously was going to turn into a battle. It's just like, wasn't his time to shine, I guess. Sees the dead hag, and then he sees uh, a bar patron coming up with a prostitute. And he goes, oh crap. And, he, and um, Crypt Breaker James, having gone psycho on this thing, he's, he's basically like just lost his like battle virginity. Because remember, he didn't do anything. In, in the first couple of fights, and he's, you know, he's not that kind of rogue. He's not a battle rogue, so this is probably the first time he's actively participated in killing something. He sees all the blood on his hands, he sees it all down his front, and he's, oh god, <clears throat> he's, he kind of freaks out a little, and then Crypt Breaker James just kind of faints, because <laughs> he's used to dealing with the dead, he's not used to causing death. You know, Neath is used to shooting animals. You know, Eden is a halberd-trained paladin, and John the Not Cleric is obviously used to killing stuff. Cryptbreaker James, not so much. He's not that kind of rogue, so he faints at the sight of all this blood everywhere. And, you know, John sees these two patrons coming. He's like, okay, hang on. And he, like, thrusts his tankard to one side, and he, with, like, one fucking hand, picks up this hag and throws her on the bed and pulls, like, the covers up to cover the blood. And then he takes one of his swords and he slices his fucking arm, like his own arm. And he wipes the blood and he puts it away. And he starts shouting at Neith that if he's going to practice with that damn thing, he should do it outside. And to watch what he's fucking doing with that thing and that all you guys are drunk, and then he immediately, like, pours his tankard out onto Crypt James, so he smells like hooch, and just... <laughs> God. I think I muted myself at that point, because I was laughing too hard, because he... I think everybody at this table has had, like, a beer at some point, other than me, because... I was raised in a family where there were enough members of the Navy, there were enough divorces uh, due to drink that I've only ever had wine and on very seldom occasions. So um, the fact that the word for what this smells like is hooch, and that's a southern word for vagina. So <laughs> James pours this out and uses a southern euphemism 
or, or, or sorry, John. John pours this out onto James, and now James smells like hooch, which is a southern word for vagina. And while I do enjoy eating at that restaurant, I can't imagine drinking a drink that smells like vagina. <laughs> and I was like, that's, and I'm, I'm muting, I've got like my hand over my microphone. I was like, that's not what he means. That's not what he means. <laughs> you smell like alcohol. That's not what he means. <laughs> so, so the patron and the prostitute go by and they glance in. They see this, this chaotic scene. There's apparently one guy passed out on the floor who smells like booze. There's one guy who's cut up. And, John, and John's like, act wasted. And Eden doesn't, apparently doesn't know how to act wasted. So she's like leaning on the on the wall like smiling as innocently as she can and there are there are such a thing as jolly drunks I mean don't worry but the the patron and the prostitute you know they see the blood spatter on the floor and they see John's like cut his arm but they hear all that crap he'd been shouting and they just kinda walk by because you know drinking and making merry comes in all shapes and sizes and things to do apparently and we're like oh god so, you know, and in hindsight, we could have just, like, shut the door, you know, and they would have walked by, and they were more interested in each other than us, but whatever. It made for a funny scene. I smelled like hooch for, for some reason. <laughs> but, um... I think that's pretty much where we left off. Uh, so a lot of a lot of role-playing, a lot of talking, a lot of running around town, and then we fight with a hag. And I think all that's left to do on our, like, list of things right now is to check out, uh, what was his name, Tom Lim? Yeah, we need to check out Tom Lim's house. Because if he's dead, and there are people hunting those who have the ring, who also have the book and the Iron Heart, then that means there's something malevolent at stake. I'm willing to bet, and this wasn't explicitly said, I'm willing to bet that the old man on the street and the elven woman, both of them, were probably the hag, uh, just under different glamour spells. Um, if not, then, you know, there's still another player out there. And whoever happened to kill Tom Lim, because I'm willing to bet he didn't die of a sudden aneurysm, so there is a, a malevolent group, I guess, who are out for the Iron Heart of Innes, and we don't even know what we have yet because we can't read the book. But I'm willing to bet that uh, Tom Lim probably had a journal, uh, you know, research papers, scrolls, something. Hopefully his house hasn't been raided yet. But I wouldn't know that because, you know, Kurt Breaker James passed out when he saw all the blood, so... When next we join our heroes, we shall hopefully go to the house of Tom Lim and see what else we can find out about the Iron Heart of Innes. And that is the end of that particular D&D &D story. Keep gaming.